hit terrain. And as you can see, this one's shiny, bright, and new, and it didn't uh, withstand anything. So back to Old Faithful. This thing has been all around the world with me climbing everywhere, and I'm right back to it. Obviously, my prosthetic is everything. I have to make sure this thing is dialed. I can't get rid of you. <laughs> I joined the Marine Corps at 17 years old. I didn't really have that time to go out and find what made me happy. I've actually only been up in a helicopter a couple times since the crash. So after the first surgery that Kirsty had, she had another one and I knew it didn't look right. She was extremely sick. They didn't know if she was going to make it. That was really scary news. I hit a downward spiral. I wanted to give up. I look at how awful my life was, and I fast forward and I look at my life now. Being out in the mountains is, is work. It's work on yourself. It's work on your head. It's work on your heart. A woman is not the person out here that you expect to see. People automatically assume she's weak. She's not going to have what it takes. It's really important to disprove that, that we're just as strong as everyone else. We have just as much determination. Nothing has to define you other than however you want to define yourself. question I get is why. I'd rather do it the hard way so that other people can look at it and say, you know what, well, I can do it better, I can do it faster, I can do it stronger than Kirsty. I want people to see it as a challenge. To get outside, just to get off the couch, do more with their life. Mountaineering is just this emotional roller coaster of everything you know one minute you think it's all gonna work out you know smashingly well and the next it's all kind of falling apart in front of you and you the whole leg used to come off it's fucking cold it's freezing and if something if something crazy like me losing my leg on the let phase happens on our summit rotation there's not really any turning back from that is it a matter of not doing what everybody else is doing which is a given because guess what? I'm not everybody else. Rumor has it that there's this summit window opening. There's a lot going on, a lot pumping through these veins. Now it's showtime. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage former Marine Sergeant, philanthropist, and Angle Invokers advisor, Kirsty Ennis. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That woman you just saw in the video has been through hell in her short 29 years. She's cheated death at least twice, she's experienced loss, and she's let war change her. She's broken herself down so that she could rebuild her life. She's failed miserably, and she's reached new unbelievable heights. She received the Pat Tillman Award at last year's ESPYs. She's this year's Higher Ground Award recipient from the Martin Luther King family. And in just a few days, she will be inducted into the 2020 International Sports Hall of Fame. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that woman is me, and none of it happened overnight. My mom and my dad got married at 18 years old. Shortly after, my dad joined the Marine Corps. At 25 years old, while my family was living on Marine Corps Base 29 Palms, my mom came home and told my dad, you know, I think these female Marines are pretty badass. My dad turned to my mom and said, I will never be married to a female Marine. 
To which my mom turned around, went out the door, went to the recruiter's office, got an age waiver, and joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving me at home with my dad while she went to boot camp. Morals of the story, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and my dad's a pain in the ass. <laughs> Immediately after earning my two-year degree from Pensacola State College, just four months after my 17th birthday, I went to the recruiter's office and told them that I wanted to join. Of course, being so young, I needed my parents' consent. My mom signed, signed immediately and said good riddance while, my <laughs> while I had to do some convincing with my dad. I had to lie through my teeth saying that I would do a desk job, like supply or admin. Long story short, when my dad dropped me after boot camp, my recruiter casually said, this is great. I've never put a female in for this type of job. My cover was blown, my father was angry, but I was well on my way. I ended up spending six years in the United States Marine Corps as a helicopter door gunner and airframes mechanic. It's safe to say that it wasn't a desk job. I fought tooth and nail to be able to wear those shiny gold wings on my chest, and I would be lying if I said it were easy. Luckily, I have thick skin, a chip on my shoulder, and I am as stubborn as they come. Being that I was the only female in my shop, it was difficult to see the men, to see for the men to see me turning wrenches and dragging my knuckles, let alone watch me man a 50 caliber machine gun. When they looked at me, they saw their wives, girlfriends, mother, sisters, and so on. But in true NS fashion, I kept my head down to do what I needed to in order to be the best aerial door gunner that I could be. I wanted the people around me to know that I would protect them just as they were protecting me. I wanted the men around me to know that I could do the same job that they were doing and that I would do it better. My first deployment to Afghanistan was with Heavy Marine Helicopter Squadrons 461 and 465. At this time, I was a whopping 19 years old. I never thought being miserable in a third world country would be something that I actually enjoyed. But being on a deployment, there's never a question of what your role is or what your purpose is. There's never a question of what your hair is going to look like, what you're going to eat, or even what you're going to wear. It's simple. Take care of yourself, take care of your men, and come home live. In August of 2011, I returned home from Afghanistan, and my family picked me up from Marine Corps Air Station Miramar. After my deployment reset, my former gunnery sergeant begged me to deploy again. Initially, I fought the idea, thinking that I had had enough of sitting in the desert for the last seven months. But two weeks later, I found myself on a, on a plane to Hawaii to train with Heavy Marine Helicopter Squadron 362, and in January of 2012, I was right back in Afghanistan. Now, Aircraft 01 was my aircraft. It's the one that I flew on day in and day out, and it's the one that I maintained. On January 19, 2012, we had a helicopter go down that killed all six crew members. This, ladies and gentlemen, was call sign Iron Tail 06. In honor of our six Marines, we painted one of our helicopters in their memory. It read, we will never forget Iron Tail 06 on the nose landing gear door, had all of their names painted on the sides, and even the 50 cows were painted for them. Fast forward, June 23, 2012, started like any other day and any other mission. I was running out to the flight line to turn up aircraft 01 when my maintenance officer snatched me up and said that there had been a change of plans. I would no longer be going out on aircraft 01. I would now be going outbound on aircraft 06, the memorial helicopter. Everything was going as, going as planned, and then suddenly, I was staring at a blue overhead light, struggling to breathe with blood rapidly filling my mouth. My leg collapsed underneath me, and my arms tore from their sockets. I screamed, but not out of pain, just shock. My tail gunner, who had been my military hero and role model, wasn't responding initially. To hell with me, I wanted to know that they were okay. They threw me into the medevac helicopter, and as I drained the blood from the now fist-sized hole in my face, the new left door gunner bent down next to me and said, don't close your freaking eyes, because you won't open them again. I told myself that I wasn't going to die without seeing my little sister, and then everything went black. This, ladies and gentlemen, was call sign Legacy 07. As a result of the crash, I sustained various injuries, a traumatic brain injury, spinal cord damage, damage to my arms, my ears, my eyes, and the left leg amputation. I endured two years of different therapies while living at the hospital and mental health. To this day, I still go to speech therapy. While all of my crew suffered injuries, I wholeheartedly believe that the reason my crew and I fared as well as we did was because the boys of Iron Tail 06 didn't let history repeat itself. In my mind, I wasn't that hurt. They were just going to sew me up and I would go right back to flying. 
I had just been combat meritoriously promoted to sergeant. They couldn't send me home. But the moment they wheeled me into the makeshift hospital on Camp Bastion, and I saw my sergeant major and gunnery sergeant standing there crying, I knew my deployment was over. The hardest thing that I have ever had to do was leave my guys behind so that they could continue the fight. While the physical injuries were terrible, the most debilitating ones were easily my invisible wounds. Joining the Marine Corps at such a young age and giving six years to it, it was all I knew. I loved it. I bled green, as they say. I had no intention on getting out of the military. I had planned on staying in another 20 years. So finding out that I was unfit for duty after fighting so long to stay active was when I crumbled. I no longer knew who I was. I not only wore scars on my body, but also my heart. Mentally and emotionally, it became very difficult for me to continue fighting for myself. I had given up. That same pain in the ass dad that I mentioned earlier gave me the tough love that I needed. I will never forget the moment that he looked at me with tears in his eyes as he said, you've got to be shitting me. <laughs> the enemy can, couldn't kill you, and now you're going to do it for them? That's the moment that I decided I was going to get my life back. It's the six inches between our ears and what's behind our ribcage that dictate what we're capable of. I realized that I was spared and chosen for this new path, whether I was ready for it or not. The moment that I decided to embrace my pain and my past and to stop inflicting it on others was when I understood that we have the power to write the rest of our stories. One chapter doesn't determine how the story is going to end. I finally understood that you can't be all in if parts of you don't show up. And if I couldn't show up for myself, then I was going to do it for the people around me, the people who needed me. So hanging on to my dad's words, I chose to continue the hardest fight of my life, my recovery. In order to cope with my injuries, I turned to the outdoors. While I was still a patient in the hospital, an organization approached me and asked if I had any desire to learn a winter sport. Quite frankly, being from Florida, I, <laughs> I knew nothing about winter or snow but I was willing to learn anything if it got me out of the hospital. To my surprise, when I arrived in Breckenridge, Colorado, no one asked me for a medical clearance. So naturally, I said I wanted to snowboard, and the rest was history. Snowboarding was now the one thing that made me want to wake up every day. I found my new outlet, my new passion. It reminds me that no one can do this for me. While it is okay for people to help me, it is up to me to decide how I'm going to live the rest of my life. Snowboarding is a reminder of my resiliency and why I fought so long to get out of my wheelchair and stay away from the hospital. It reminds me that I am one of the fortunate ones who may be broken, but I am still here and I still can. I made the goal to compete in the Winter Paralympics, but shortly after, my suffering was brought to another level. After already being a blow the knee amputee, I later suffered a vascular necrosis and catching MRSA in the hospital. This took my leg to an above the knee amputation. I screamed in agony as they told me that they might have to take my hip. I yelled, do not wake me up if you have to take it that high. Being an above the knee amputee as, is, as they say, a whole new ball game. And yet again, I thought my dream of making my country proud by wearing the Team USA uniform was turned into a nightmare. Since I lost the 2016 and 17 snowboarding seasons to my injuries, I decided that I would heal and take to the mountains in a different way, by climbing and mountaineering. I decided that I would climb Kilimanjaro, the highest point in Africa, in March of 2017. This was only four short months after my last surgery and my last effort to keep my spirits high. Mountaineering kept me focused and gave me something to put my energy into. I ended up summiting Mount Kilimanjaro, but that was not the best part. We ended up raising over $150,000 for clean water for the East Tanzanians. Thank you. <laughs> And this was just the start. 2017 was the beginning of the best years of my life. Since then, I completed a third master's and started a doctorate, all against my doctor's odds and orders. I got back up on my snowboard and competed again. I founded my own nonprofit, the Kirstianis Foundation, real original, I know. <laughs> my mom and I joined forces at Engel and Volker's Carbondale. <laughs> I became a serial entrepreneur in Southern California, investing in my friends who sat tirelessly by my side in the hospital. 
and I decided that I would attempt to be the first woman above knee amputee to climb the highest peak on each of the seven continents while raising money and awareness for disabled and underserved populations around the world. On February 1st, 2019, I stood on top of the highest point in South America. It's also the highest point outside of the Himalayas at 22,841 feet, and better known as Aconcagua, or the Mountain of Death. To date, this has been my proudest summit as I became the first woman amputee to ever stand on top. <laughs> Aconcagua was quite a feat, but ultimately, it was a determining factor in what my next climb would be. My successes in the mountains reassured me that I was ready for Everest. I spent April and May of 2019 in Nepal making my first Everest attempt. For seven weeks, I climbed the tallest mountain in the world. For nearly four weeks, I never went below Camp One. In other words, I never went below 6,000 meters or 20,000 feet. I lived off of expired MREs, you guys can figure that one out, <laughs> and struggled through countless hours of tent time. On my summit day, wind tore through my face, making it like leather and my lips like sandpaper. My eyes suffered damage from the elements, my climbing partners ran out of oxygen, and we dealt with Sherpa, leaving us in the death zone. I came home 15 pounds lighter than I am right now, and my lungs had no idea how to react to the thick oxygen in Colorado. But please know that this is for far more than ego or making history. This is to inspire the next generations. This is to provide education, opportunity, and healing in the outdoors. This is to push the limits in medical device technology and to create new tools to improve the quality of life for others. This is to redefine what it is to be disabled or injured. This is to show that we write our own definitions in life. Now, I can't stop. Better yet, I won't stop. I want to show the world that anything is possible, given you are willing to work for it. Though I am missing a leg, I have mastered the art form of convincing myself to put one foot in front of the other. The art form of being comfortable with being uncomfortable, and ultimately, I've learned to suffer well. By taking a step back and reassessing who I was and where I was, I reattached myself to a different but very similar purpose. I joined the Marine Corps to serve people. Now, I'm going to continue to serve, just in a different way. Today, I can say that I truly live my life for other people. When we are able to think clearly about the situations that we have been given, we hold the power to eliminate what stands in our way. So strip away the excess. All too often, we focus on what lies on the surface that's going on in our life instead of focusing on what it holds for our future. Stop clouding your mind with fog and distractions and be clear on your direction. Something I've learned on my journey and my never-ending quest for more is that th thinking quickly becomes our best friend and worst enemy. While it gives us our reassurance and confidence, it is the very same thing that holds us back from our deepest desires and greatest successes. Stop overthinking and start showing up for what calls to you. When I stopped being my harshest critic and started appreciating my ambition and passion for the outdoors and people, I was able to make change so that I could reach my personal and professional summits. I didn't tell you these things for pity or accolades, but more importantly, to show you what opportunity and the human spirit can do. I have been extremely blessed to have people come out of the woodworks to get me back to being who Kirsty really is. And this is my time to pay it forward. I hope that there is someone out there watching me right now, thinking that they can do this better than me, and then I hope that they actually try. What I have been through has been a blessing and a curse. It is a curse that I wouldn't wish on my own worst enemy. I've suffered an extreme amount of loss at a very young age. I lost years of my life to the hospital and to recovery. I lost my military career. I lost the majority of my memory. And the most obvious, I lost my leg. But I choose to focus on what I've gained. And my biggest blessing has been my new perspective on life. Had this not happened to me, I would not be spending time with you guys today. In the end, the people I have helped, the people that I'm surrounded by, and the people in front of me right now were all worth it. You were worth it. I don't have to know you personally to know that you have felt pain, been disappointed, or suffered in some way too. We're human and life affects us all differently, but we all feel the weight of the world at times. Sometimes it's anger, fear, frustration, or even heartbreak. While we can't control what this sometimes crazy, vicious world throws at us, 
I am here to show you that we control what we make of it. It's your life and it's dictated by your choices. Our thoughts, emotions, and perspectives, they're all choices. The greatest gift you can give yourself is to choose you what defines your success and to take action. That said, there's nothing out there and no one out there that can make you quit. You're going to stumble and you will fail. Hell, <laughs> I've failed countless times, in fact. I've failed personally and professionally. I've made mistakes. I've lost in races. I've had to turn around in the mountains. I've hurt others in relationships, and I promise I'm far from perfect. Failure is a part of life, though. I'm not special, and I hate to break it to you, but nor are you. <laughs> our, attitude, our attitude can allow us to make excuses for ourselves, or it can inspire us. Failure should be the moment that empowers us to be the best version of ourselves. It means we care enough to actually try. We should view failure as opportunity, opportunity to come back better, faster, and stronger than we were before. Remember, the obstacles that come with our hardships may be the very same things that catapult us into the best moments of our lives. My injuries led me to my skills and talents beyond what I knew in the military. My mistakes led me to figuring out where I actually wanted to be in life. All while my weaknesses have taught me to never be stagnant because there's always room to grow. Through everything, I'm just as grateful for the moments of disappointment as I am for the moments of glory. Those are the reminders of my grit and my grace. I've been asked countless times what the method to my madness is, and it's simple. The right actions follow the right perspectives. On the days when the bad starts to outweigh the good, I remember my why. I started all of this athletically and professionally because I didn't have the role model that I needed or wanted when I was in the hospital. So I constantly remind myself of the people watching, the young ones who need someone to be a pillar of hope, the men and women looking for inspiration to keep going, and the non-believers waiting for my middle finger as I prove them wrong. <laughs> my why is not about me anymore. It's about all the sets of eyes that are on me. Whether it's making someone smile throughout the day, lending a hand to help someone reach a goal, or watching another person shatter boundaries to create change, I am fueled by wit witnessing the happiness, health, and success of others. Putting others before myself is what got me through the most challenging years of my life. By focusing on what I can do for others, my problems and my pain dissipated. By putting my heart and soul into the work that I do, I'm rewarded in ways far greater than any number in a paycheck. I am wealthy in experiences and relationships. I never dreamed that my struggles would lead me to where I am today. While whatever you are going through may not make, make sense, we never know where it's leading us, so stay the course. Now, more than ever before, I am in love with my climb, figuratively and literally. I know that we all started 2020 off with goals, but I'm here to remind you to take it that extra step further, rest a moment less, and endure a fraction more because you don't even know what, we, what you're capable of yet. I encourage you to make peace with your pain, to reflect on what you have and what you can give, and to remember your why. What you do, what we do, matters, far more than any of you realize. We are movers and shakers, problem solvers, therapists at times, but most importantly, we are game changers. So embrace what this ever-changing life holds and never settle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Kirsty Ennis, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, if that doesn't make you think what's holding me back from climbing to my mountain, I don't know what else does. I mean, what, what a badass. <laughs> I just can't think of anything else better than to say that. Good morning, everyone. I have a little more voice at the end of this year than I did at last year. So what'd you think of this morning? You happy, Melissa? It was actually worth getting up and coming in for, wasn't it? 
What did you all think of the two panels this morning? I think my person, go ahead, yeah. I think, I think Adam and Ed Renee did an incredible job. I don't think they've ever been any better than they were this morning. And the panels, the best I've ever seen on this stage. That was just great, great information. I mean, just, I was taking notes saying, I want to go sell real estate. I just, oh, that's, a, oh, I wish I thought of that. That was just, it was so, so good. Um, and Stefan is just always incredible. I just, I can just, I just like being near him. He's just energy and his knowledge and, and the trends report. Uh, there are trends reports, uh, I think, out there. And there, if you uh, fill out those cards and giving, uh, give them over to us at Brand Central, I think we can get them back in and get those out to you. So there's a lot of reasons I love exchange. A lot of reasons like coming here. Uh, and one of them is because as a leader and as an organization, but especially as a leader, uh, we have to make a lot of decisions. And when we come to exchange, it's one of our opportunities to validate, are we making the right decisions? Am I personally making the right decisions? And uh, I can tell you one of my takeaways this year is that I must have made the right decision when it comes to my hair. <laughs> one third of our network has downloaded app, or uh, a command, our app, one third. I was talking to Stefan back in the back. He said, you know, some, some brands have taken 10 years to get 20%. Gary Keller over at Kelly Williams says, if you get 20% of his uh, organization to do anything, that is a home run. This morning, we're at almost 1,300 people who are downloaded Command and are working in the Command app. So, <clears throat> so we need you to validate when we're doing it right. I know none of you are shy when we're not doing it the way you think we should be doing it. You let us know that. But I also think it's very important that we continue that collaboration. It's important that we don't look at it being the brand versus you, us versus them. You know, we say this is us. We are a we. And it's important when things are going right that we pat each other on the back. And when things are not going as well as we want, that we collaborate and we work together to come up with better answers and newer ways of doing things. This cannot be adversarial. It's hard out there, as, Car as Carl said on the first day. This is a tough business, and it's very competitive. But when you take the energy that we have harnessed in this room and in this brand, and when we work all together with a singular vision of being the best we can be, of climbing to our peaks, we don't need a billion dollars in the bank. We can do it. And we've been doing it for 40 some years globally, for since 19, uh, 2007 here in the US, since 2014 in the Americas, since whatever year you joined Angle and Folkers. So I challenge you to keep, keep, keep doing that. I want to thank all of our incredible speakers this year. I think the best we've ever had. Again, the panels, the speakers, the red talks, everything in my mind was spot on. And I will tell you, again, this is not a shy group. Our group has been comparing notes, looking for the complaints. And you guys are just complimenting. And we really, really appreciate it. I've said it before, we're gonna make mistakes. Some of the things we try to do are not gonna work out. Some of the things we want to happen won't happen. But this team, they give a damn, they care. They want to bring it for you, and uh, I think they brought it for you this time. I want to thank our sponsors this time. Excuse me, our partners, part of our partner network now. Platinum Luxury Auctions, the Flawless Bar. The Flawless Bar loves you, and apparently you love them too. <laughs> so they will probably be joining us again in the future. As a matter of fact, almost all of our partners have said this is one of the best events they've ever attended. And a lot of them have already said they will be here again with us next year. Zillow, Realtor.com, Resora, Jawai, Addressable, Lowen Sign Company, Oakley Sign Company and Graphics, Roof Rush, Concierge Auctions, Mod and Telekey, Peter Rainey, Custom Tailors. He did this one. <laughs> Vintage Wine Estates, and of course, all of our new friends, Walt and Leanne, and all of the other yachtsmen at Engel and Folkers Yachting here in the Americas. <clears throat> I've only done this one other time from the stage because in all honesty, it's hard to find an organization 
that raises the bar, especially when it comes to properties like the one we're in today. But the Monarch team has been phenomenal since the first day we set foot on this property two years ago. And they're still knocking it out behind the scenes all around to take care of you. Thank you, Monarch, for being our host. Thank you, Monarch, for doing an incredible job. My next thank you I've never made from this stage. As a matter of fact, I've kind of made jokes in the past about how sometimes they haven't been as good as they need to be, because at this time I figured, what the heck, if they turn off the lights and the mics, I can yell loud enough. This AV team from PSAV has been incredible. And you all don't know that because it all happens behind the scenes. You all knocked it out of the park. <clears throat> For you that haven't been backstage, there's this group over here, and there's a whole nother group behind that panel over there, and there's about another team standing by to take all this and take it to the next location. It'll all probably be gone in an hour. These men and women are incredible, and we thank PSAV for doing such a great job. Okay, so I'm almost there. My voice has got, it's, it's counting down here, so. Um, this has never happened before either, and I have to thank you all for this. During this event, we've signed three new license partners. So please welcome Charleston, Northwest Philadelphia, and Cashiers, Asheville, North Carolina, who are now part of our family officially, and hopefully we'll see them on the stage next year. Only one or two more. Svenodia, I'm not sure if you're in the room, but thank you so much for joining us. It was great having him on the stage with us last night. I know a lot of you got a chance to spend some time with him as well, and I always love when Sven or Christian or anyone else from our Hamburg headquarters can come and visit us. So Sven, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> and thank all of you. I mean, I know what it's like, especially this year at this time, to be, decide to be here. It's not an inexpensive ticket. It's not an inexpensive, inexpensive uh, travel arrangements. It's not an inexpensive resort. Um, and again, this year there were extra challenges about whether or not you felt you could be here. Well, I'm glad you all braved it. I'm glad you're all here. And uh, I just thank all of you from the bottom of my heart every single day because it's not because of what I've done or what our incredible team has done. It's because of what you have done and continue to do every day that we're experiencing our success. Congratulations to all of our award winners last night, and especially the team from Engel and Volkers, Montreal, for being our sixth cup winners. And I know you all know how this goes, so I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Can we bring our team to the stage? Because this is the group that made all this happen and makes everything happen every year. This is the staff of Engel and Volkers Americas. Right before this event starts, uh, Caitlin and, and Dan, uh, who produced the event, take us all on a tour of the property so we can be of uh, the service to all of you. And it kind of hit me hard that as we're walking around with this entire group of people on this property, that the very first exchange in Manhattan, there were only 45 participants. There are more people on the team supporting you now <laughs> than there were at the very first exchange. So give them one more round of applause. Do you all trust me? Do you trust them? Yeah. Okay, because I know some of you are gonna love what I'm about to say, and some of you are gonna go, oh no. <laughs> but trust us, because next year's exchange is not exchange anymore. 
It's called EVX. And next year's EVX, <laughs> are we ready for this? It's going to be incredible. Where's it going to be? Give it to us. You can't see it, but it says Las Vegas. <laughs> Cosmopolitan. <clears throat> it's going to be in Las Vegas at the Cosmopolitan. If you don't want to do the casino at the Cosmopolitan, what an incredible location. You don't even have to walk through the casino. You can stay in our tower. You don't have to see any of the strip. And if you do, and I know some of you do, you can also go enjoy the strip. So we will see all of you next year in Las Vegas at the Cosmopolitan. Have a great year, everyone. Thank you.